Hello and uh, welcome to the European Report. Uh, here we are once again in the uh, European Parliament, uh, which is the heart of the European Union. And in today's programme we have an all-star cast and we'll be discussing the recent terrorism and violence that we've witnessed in Jerusalem uh, last month. We'll also be discussing the European Parliament's uh, plan to have a vote on a unilateral Palestinian state. We'll be asking what does that mean? And finally we'll be discussing is the EU indirectly uh, helping Hamas rebuild its terror tunnels and its terrorist infrastructure with EU aid money. And in today's programme I'm joined by Thomas Sandel the founder and director of the European Coalition for Israel. And on my left is um, Dermot Kehoe, the chief That's executive on. of uh, BICOM. And we have uh, Arne Gerkel, MEP for Germany and the European Conservative and Reformist Group. And Alex Benjamin, who's the director of public affairs for European Friends of Israel, soon to be the executive director. So, gentlemen, welcome to the program. Um, firstly, Arne, can you share your, your story, how you got involved in politics, how did you become an MP here in, in the European Parliament and where did your passion for Israel stem from? Well, <clears throat> I belong to the family party in Germany and am since May in the European Parliament and uh, are a lonely member of the, um, <clears throat> the, the family party so I have to fight my way through uh, the European Parliament and when I arrived here we had a situation I, I, uh, when there, there were very arguments going around with, um, <clears throat> with Israel and Gaza, Israel and the West Bank, and it was hard for me to believe um, what was said within the European Parliament. So um, I was happy to meet at one point the Friends of Israel here in, in, in Brussels, and that was a very good point for me uh, to to really just recheck what was said here in the uh, European Parliament and what was really happening. And um, I found very, very trustworthy what I was told by the Friends of Israel later on. Of course, I also met others um, from the embassy and other, other people who um, belong uh, or, or who can be called Friends of Israel. Excellent. And just also, why did you want to get involved in politics? Uh, not, it's not everyone's cup of tea, it's not everyone's kind of flavour, but uh, what made you decide that you want to be uh, an MEP? Well, I mean, calling it family party, of course, <laughs> my main interest is family, on families. And, and regarding that, um, I know that family policies are not dealt with in the European Parliament because that's something which belongs to the member states. But on the other hand, many decisions are made within the European Parliament which affect then families. And that's what I want to stand for, that I want to look after that only uh, things that positively um, affect the families uh, can be uh, put through, others have to be stopped. Yeah. Uh, excellent. Uh, and Dermot, you're Chief Executive of BICOM, uh, the, the prestigious Israel communications organization okay. based in, in London. Um, can you also share some of the, the troubles that uh, you face in presenting Israel's side of the argument pretty much to the British media? Well, I mean, the media is vital in terms of um, explaining to, to the general public about the issues. And as Arnie was saying, a lot of the things people hear often bear, bear little relation to, to what's going on on the ground. So, so our job in BICOM is to provide that information, to provide that analysis, uh, and to ensure that, that Israel is better understood and gets a fair hearing. I mean, I always say our, our biggest um, our, our biggest weapon, our best weapon, <laughs> is probably, our, our best weapon is always the truth, the reality of what's happening in Israel. And the more people know about that, the more people understand Israel, the more the more people will will um, empathise and support what Israel is seeking to do, as the only you know democratic, peaceful nation in the region. Yeah. And uh, Alex Benjamin, you are soon to be the uh, executive director of. Uh, European Friends of Israel, but before that you've had a bit of a colourful uh, political experience in Northern Ireland. Can you share with our, our viewers something about uh, life in Northern Ireland and the politics in Northern Ireland and how you became to be working here in the European Parliament? Sure, well I have uh, an Irish mother and uh, anyway my parents ended up getting divorced and I moved back to Northern Ireland with my, my mum. I was a, a London boy born and bred so it was a bit of a culture shock. and. Uh, through, uh, through studies, I ended up at Queen's University in Belfast. And also, through studying politics, I ended up uh, working 
firstly in advertising, and then I just happened to have a house share with David Trimble, who was the leader of the Unionist Party at the time. Uh, he was his press secretary, and the Northern Ireland Assembly had just started started uh, coming into its own, and they needed a press guy. So I went and I basically did uh, press guy for the Ossie Unionist Party in the fledgling Northern Ireland Assembly. Ended up working throughout the whole peace process. Eventually got promoted to communications director. Ended up coming out here, worked with the Tories for a while, they sort of poached me. And through that, I got to, through the ECR, I got to um, know the European Friends of Israel. Um, and I became involved in that and that's, that's how I came to, to be in Brussels. Excellent. Uh, and uh, Thomas, uh, can you give us an update of your ECI conference you had here last month and maybe some of the outcomes of, of that conference? Thank you, Simon. It's good to be back in such a colourful and high calibre setup. Um, Absolutely. We had a good conference uh, last month and um, there were a number of things that I, I think it's worth mentioning. We issued a joint statement on behalf of persecuted Christians in the Middle East and uh, also for a coherent strategy, EU strategy, against anti-Semitism in Europe. The interesting thing is that we were able to do this together with the Jewish community, so the European Jewish Congress and the Christian community through the Pentecostal uh, European Fellowship, a seven million member strong organization. What we wanted to say with the uh, with the joint statement, which will be handed over to Mogherini and, and Tusk in due time, is that uh, there are problems in the Middle East, but the problems in the Mi Middle East are not in Israel. They're outside of Israel, and uh, this is what the European Parliament, the European institutions should be focusing on when, when Christians and other religious minorities in the thousands are being killed. The only stable democracy, as Dermot said, in the whole region is, is Israel. Therefore, Israel should be encouraged, supported, and be receiving praise in this house, not criticism. Yeah. And uh, Alex, I want to bring you on to our first uh, discussion, and that is the horrific murders that we saw in Jerusalem um, last month. Really, um, the, the horrendous murder that we saw at uh, Har Nuf Synagogue in, uh, in Jerusalem was absolutely shocking. But what was your reaction to the fact that four uh, Jewish rabbis were murdered, including a British rabbi, in uh, what can only be described as something out of the Holocaust or something out of the pogroms. Well, I mean, you've put it, uh, you've put it, you've put it uh, perfectly. I mean, there, there can't be a, a, a right-thinking human being on the planet who wasn't appalled at that. And I, I think it takes a particularly sadistic mind to go in during Sakharit, which uh, is morning prayers. A play where, where part of our prayers are actually calling for peace and uh, praising God and somebody comes in and murders you in cold blood at a place of worship. I mean, it's just, it's just so utterly abhorrent that um, as a communications person, words actually fail me to describe, to describe how, I, how, how disgusted I was at it. And, uh, and Arnie, I just want to bring you on, on board on this one. I mean, in your opinion, how much blame can we be placed on the escalation of violence and the radicalization of the Arab residents in Jerusalem from the incitement in the Palestinian Authority's media, its education system, that's clearly having an impact on the next gen generation? And do you think the EU is doing enough to confront this uh, evil that we're seeing today? Well, regarding the EU, I think um it, what was just said is, I think the, 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 the reason, the main reason is that there is a different way of thinking. Yeah? We're thinking we're, that we're negotiating on the same level, but there's a different way of thinking. So we never really reach the same uh, sides. Yeah? And I've, for my um, <coughs> person, have decided, talking about, to make a decision, I have to see how the history is built this historic view i don't want to want to go too far back but i've talked to a, to a palestinian and he told me very clearly the reason why the palestinians are isolated and they went back he went back into the beginning of the 90s when uh, saddam hussein was still in the iraq yeah and arafat uh, 
took him, took sides and supported Saddam Hussein. And from That's that true. time on, the Palestinians were isolated because they had Arab friends, but the Arab friends kicked them out now. They didn't want anything to do to have some, with somebody who was supporting Saddam Hussein. So now they were not only isolated re, re, regarding the country part, but they were also isolated from their own friends. So um, this shows that um, <coughs> really he um, uh, analyzes very good to see his own situation. But then when he went to, for the solution, I was astonished. He said, well, all of us Arabs should gather and start throwing stones at Israel and really just getting them out, throwing them out of the country, pushing them in the uh, Mediterranean Sea and let them drown and get rid of them. Yeah? So that's where you say, okay, he had a cl clear view on history, but then he has a solution where you think there's something which, has just, which doesn't fit, yeah? which just sounds mad. Yeah? I, I think um, that there's been a, a slow pressure cooker building up in Jerusalem and it started uh, when the three um, Israeli kids were abducted at the, at the bus stop and since then, since then there's been a ratcheting up and it certainly hasn't been helped by the Palestinian leadership. I mean you have Abbas coming out saying there should be a war in Jerusalem, you have uh, Hamas um, actively glorifying and encouraging people to get in their cars and uh, drive into innocent uh, Israelis. And not just Israelis, I mean, as an American citizen was, was murdered, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, was it an Ecuadorian or a, a Colombian? Yes, yes, uh, a woman, And, and uh, you know, there's, they are certainly inciting the situation. If anything, I think Israel has tried, made efforts, by meeting with the Jordanians and others to try and calm the situation down. But when the Palestinian leadership is actively pushing for, as Hamas wants, a third intifada and making it, making it in Jerusalem, then we have a serious problem. Yeah. And it's, and it's as, exactly yeah. as Mr. Gerica pointed out. It's, you know, the balance is you're negotiating with one side, but the, the, the other side are, are on a completely different, uh, different level. Yeah. How can I support an aggressor? If I finance an aggressor, it's as if I buy the weapons which they will use against myself. Yeah? And they will use against friends, of course. So thinking of Israel as a, a state um, built on democratic rights, then, uh, then of course, um, I cannot finance the enemy. Absolutely. Uh, Dermot, I just want to bring you on um, with your expertise and knowledge of uh, media. How do you think the media coverage has been on the recent trouble in Jerusalem? It's almost as if the mainstream media, mainstream Western media in particular, is actually justifying Palestinian violence by saying, well, this is because of new Israeli settlement announcements in Jerusalem. This is because the Israelis are not allowing access onto the Temple Mount, which is mm -hmm. holy not only to Jews, but Christians, also Muslims as well. And, and do you think this is fueling the flames of violence? Well, I mean, I think these, these terrible tragedies, as you were talking about earlier, should, should provide a sort of moment of, of moral clarity for us in terms of whatever the details, in terms of the negotiations are going on, nothing can justify murdering uh, people in cold blood, murdering uh, men of faith in cold blood for, for no reason whatsoever. Now, what I think happens in some parts of the media and in some political discourse and some uh, academic forums is there's this, um, what, what I call this sort of infantilizing of the, of the Palestinians. They're not given responsibility for actions that they undertake as, in, as individuals, but also their leaderships. Whereas the Israelis are always painted as the aggressors, even when they're, they're the victims, and um, deemed to be in disgust to what extent they are responsible for, for various things that go on. The Palestinians are never given uh, agency, either moral agency or political agency, yet the leadership of the Palestinians um, has made a series of choices. We've been touched on some of those through history and continues to make choices to this day. Choices about entering into negotiations, choices about making compromises, choices about whether to incite or whether to build coexistence. And unfortunately, um, in some sections of, of, uh, of the discourse, they, they are not treated as what I would call adults. And I think that's not very helpful either to 
the peace process or indeed to Palestinians themselves because their only route uh, to get uh, statehood that they, that they seek <coughs> is by taking responsibility for their position and entering into, into negotiations and making those compromises and those deals. But they seem unwilling to do so. Yeah. That's an excellent point. As well. no, no, sorry, just a moment. Uh, Thomas, um, also want to bring you very much involved in this one. I mean, uh, are we not actually witnessing um, the as Alex said earlier, that Hamas are wanting to ignite almost a religious war, a third intifada, and, and clearly we're seeing the hands of the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas behind this recent escalation in Jerusalem. Isn't there a great danger now that Jerusalem is going to be seen as a rallying cry for the Islamic community worldwide? And essentially what they want to do is they want to unite the Arab streets mm -hmm. with Jerusalem as its focus to ignite a religious war outside of the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Mm -hmm. I think it has been a religious conflict from the very start and I think we, we make a great mistake if we only see it as a small territorial uh, conflict. Uh, Christian Berger, the head of the Middle East uh, section at the European External Action Service, uh, shared an interesting anecdote from, uh, uh, from, uh, from no, even from Syria. And he said they, they had uh, Pakistani uh, militants reaching Syria and, uh, you know, the question was, which way to Jerusalem. So, you know, Jerusalem as the rallying point, the Temple Mount as the rallying point, way beyond uh, a local uh, political conflict between Israelis and, and Palestinians, where you have uh, Pakistanis uh, being, being ignited to, to liberate, so, so to speak, liberate Jerusalem. I think it, it speaks about the reality which is beyond what we can understand in our secularized uh, European context. We mentioned in the same discussion with uh, Christian Berger also uh, expressed our concern about the language used uh, not by Hamas because we know who Hamas are, they're a terrorist organization, but also the radicalization of Fatah. And, and, you know, when Abbas would call the Jewish presence on the Temple Mount uh, contamination, when he would call for a day of uh, revenge, which then led to the, to the brutal killing of, of the rabbis. And, and we said at that point that the European Union should put the funding on, uh, on hold until uh, the incitements has stopped at, uh, on the Palestinian side. And we think this is a legitimate uh, call. Uh, and Alex, I'll just bring you on board on this one. Now, we, we are here in the European Parliament. What role do you think uh, or responsibility the EU has to ensure that we end the incitement to violence and the glorification of terrorism that we see in the Palestinian media and education system that's really fueling this conflict? And since the, the EU has such a commitment to building uh, the infrastructure for a Palestinian state, don't we have leverage? You'd like to think so, but at the moment it uh, it's all seems to be a bit of one-way traffic. The focus seems to be solely on Israel and particularly the, the settlements question. Um, I don't see any big effort on the part of the EU to, to, uh, to do what, what, what Thomas was, 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 was outlining, i.e. say, OK, we're going, to stop, we're going to stop the funds until your language and your rhetoric starts changing, until you start making some kind of uh, less, in, less um, inciting comments. I just, I, I don't see it. I don't detect an appetite for it in here. Sadly, uh, you know, it's more out of uh, sadness and anger, but I, I think that's, that's the reality. But at the moment, the eyes are all on uh, our eyes are all on Israel, and and again, sadly, the pendulum very seldom seems to swing back on the on the Palestinian side. Uh, and Thomas, the next issue we're going to discuss mm. is this Parliament here. The European mm. Parliament is going to be discussing uh, and also voting on a recognition of a Palestinian state. Since this is an issue that's very close to your heart, mm. you've done a lot of work on this issue at very very high diplomatic level. Um, what are your concerns regarding this vote recognizing a unilateral Palestinian state here in the uh, European Parliament? Mm. Well, without going into the legal, legal argument, and I think that's a question in itself that is worth looking into, just looking at the political message that it's sending out to the world and to the Palestinians, there are two messages. One is, don't worry to ne negotiate, we will give you what you're asking for without negotiations. Don't worry about any compromises. You know, you don't have to compromise, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll give you the deal and, and just sit, uh, sit put and we'll 
continue to put the pressure on the Israelis. And uh, then we are talking about the time frame. Now we are looking at November 2016 as a potential deadline for when, uh, and there's a resolution now which may be presented any day at the Security Council, which would give a deadline and which would basically spell out, well, this is what needs to happen within two years. And, and basically what they are saying also is that, you know, all pressure on Israel, Palestinians, just, uh, you know, watch your language a little bit, but don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll get you to state. And th there are no conditions to it. And I think this is very worrisome. Yeah. And Alex, do you believe that if this uh, parliament votes in favour of a unilateral Palestinian state, will this advance the peace process? Uh, because we've heard a lot of comments come out of the European institutions, uh, particularly saying, threatening Israel, that if Israel doesn't push forward the peace process, stop the settlements, then the EU will review diplomatic relations and its status with uh, with, uh, with with State of Israel. So, can you share with us your thoughts yeah, on I, this? I, I see it as I see it as uh, actually very counterproductive, on on two on a, on a couple of fronts. First, because if Parliament decides to unilaterally accept a Palestinian state, well, we're talking about a two-state solution. We were talking before we came on air with 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 Dermot. Effectively, you will end up with a three-state solution, because Fatah. Uh, Fatah uh, Palestine is not the same as Hamas Palestine. So Fatah is already serious enough. But when you throw in Hamas, are EU parliamentarians seriously saying that we are willing to unilaterally recognize a state with Hamas as, as its leadership? It seems to be a fundamental contradiction given that Hamas is a prescribed organization by, by the EU. So uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. I don't think it's going to, to push um, Israel to the negotiating table. Ironically, it will push a new government, which as you know, we've got an elections on the 17th of March, sends, sending such a strong signal to, to, uh, to a government which hasn't even been formed yet and saying, well, this is, this is where we side. I don't see how this does anything for good relations in the neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, Anani, how, how will you be voting? Uh, on, on this issue and how are other MEPs being influenced to vote? I think um, I myself uh, am pretty sure that I will vote against uh, a new state uh, regarding Palestine because uh, I'll just add, I think sure. Abbas, if he went to Gaza, he would be killed. Yeah, no question. Uh, so so uh, whom are we negotiating with now? And that's, that's what I think the European Parliament always makes a step before they start thinking or they start really uh, looking what's going on yeah i know the we're not the only ones who support uh, the the region also the americans do and as far as i know they care for every cent they spend there uh, how it is uh, what is done with the money yeah whereas um, regarding the eu uh, a lot of money disappears and speaking about uh, the amount which which has has already been given it's it's billions which have gotten lost uh, as far as i know too Two billions got lost, and now we're already speaking about even a higher sum uh, uh, of that. No, no. Pardon? T two billions. Two billions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we're already speaking about a sum which is even uh, very high already, and and nobody really cares of where it is spent and and what is uh, who who is going to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is very um, hard to understand. The Israels are put under fire and are supposed to be, act in a diplomatic way. Yeah? Their religious leaders are being killed, murdered, yeah? and still they, are not, uh, they shall not shoot back in the same way. So what is expected of Israel and what is uh, then just given to the, the Palestinians? That's a very yeah. queer way yeah. of doing policy. Yes. Yeah, uh, and Dermot, uh, we had the uh, British Parliament uh, voted uh, on recognising a Palestinian state uh, by uh, backbenchers, MPs, uh, but it had uh, little or no impact on British foreign policy towards a two-state solution and a unilateral Palestinian state. Um, in your opinion, uh, what are the dangers for Israel if more European governments um, start to recognise a unilateral Palestinian state and what will this mean for the peace process? We've already seen Belgium voting on this, um, Ireland have as well, uh, plus France voted last week in, in support of a Palestinian state and it seemed to be gathering momentum. I mean, I, I think it's deeply threatening uh, to the peace process, frankly, and I'm particularly interested to hear what 
Alex has to say, with, 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 with uh, experience in Northern Ireland. And it goes against all the um, methods of, of conflict resolution. I think, mean, personally, for, for my part, I'd, I'd, I want to see a Palestinian state at some point. That can only exist alongside an Israeli state, and that can only be achieved through negotiations and compromise um, and agreement with Israel. There is no shortcut to this. There is no, <coughs> there is no um, route that does not go through negotiations with Israel. And if that's not underlined to the Palestinian leadership every single time by responsible actors like the European Union and the UK and the US, it undermines the peace process. Because if you think you can get, you can achieve what you want, but you don't have to talk to the other side, you don't have to recognize their borders, you don't have to guarantee not to fire rockets into their territory or to murder their civilians. You can be handed on a plate just by going to third parties who frankly it costs them nothing to pass a resolution. One of the most deeply um, depressing things about this is people are, are it's, it's, you know, it's what they used to call in the old days, you know, resolutionary socialism rather than revolutionary socialism. You pass a motion, it costs you nothing, but causes uh, uh, deep, deep damage. So I think if people understood just how threatening this is to what we all actually genuinely want to see, and that's genuine, sustainable peace, but that must involve Israel. And unfortunately, some of these, these unilateral motions often don't do that. Yeah. Uh, Anani, can, maybe you can explain, I know that you are new to the uh, European Parliament and EU institutions, but there does seem to be an impression amongst uh, EU policymakers, and also in the Parliament in particular, so much focus and attention given to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict when we're seeing much wider issues um, threaten European security, such as the rise of ISIS, the fact that 5,000 European Muslims have gone out to join ISIS in Syria and also in Iraq. We see that Iran is on the threshold of developing nuclear weapons, which would be a game changer in the Middle East for the worse. Uh, and also we're seeing the ethnic cleansing of so many Christians throughout the region. Do you think there is an over-emphasis on focusing on the Israeli-Palestinian issue and not other Middle Eastern issues? I think seeing, seeing what is done now in Iraq uh, and regarding the Christians who are, are put under attack there too, really we have comparable situations. I think find it difficult to compare anything uh, to the situation in Israel because that has an history which is uncomparable to any, anything else. But seeing the Christians in um, uh, the Iraq region who are put under force there, I think we can learn from Israel. Yeah? Um, the only solution I see there is to bring our people home because they will be threatened. They will be threatened after the... Even if we make a peace contract, a peace process in that region, they will always have to look in the eyes of their attackers they will never find a real peace there. So we have only one solution, bring our people home, bring the Christians home where they, where, where they are surrounded by people who belong to them. And I think this is something we are, um, I miss the English word now, we, we have to pass on to Israel. We have to give Israel a possibility to live in peace in their own country with their own people and this is something which should be the main um, reason or the, the main um, fundament on which e the EU Parliament should decide. Yeah, I just want to follow up something you said about the Christians from the Middle East should come to Europe or come to the West. But wouldn't you argue that, they, that the Christian communities predate Islam uh, and so therefore they are an ancient communities uh, and therefore they're The, the, the Christians in the Middle East are already home. I mean, that's their home, and I think, I think what, what Europe can give to it is, is the European traditions of, of uh, tolerance and, and, you know, hopefully one day democracy. But to be fair to, be fair to those people, that they're already home, that is their home. And, and it, you know, it may be necessary to, to grant them refugee status, but, but I certainly hope it doesn't come to that. At the moment, it'd be better if they could live in the, in the home that they've had, as, as Simon says, for millennia. Yeah, but being lifelong refugees in in their own home place, is, I find a, a diff very difficult situation. And what I think is, it's easy for the European Parliament to pass on blankets, tents, money, and whatsoever. But we give away the responsibility we're supposed to carry. 
We don't really look into the situation. We don't really look who is the aggressor, who is the victim. We just find the fast solution. And I think this solution is mostly not the best. Yeah. Uh, and, and Alex, I almost want to echo the same thing. I mean, you, you know, you're working here with MPs, you're working here amongst the European institutions. And uh, maybe you can explain why there's this over obsession with the uh, Israeli Palestinian conflict, trying to find a, a resolution, even forcing through a kind of resolution, when we're seeing much bigger issues and wider issues that actually directly threaten European security, such as the rise of ISIS, the rise of Islamic extremism in the Middle East and also here in Europe the Iranian nuclear issue uh, and other issues which surely uh, should be uh, the focus and the attention of sure. the uh, diplomatic no, I, I, community I in you, Europe. I hear you, but every, every issue which you outlined from an EU point of view, from, a, from an EAS point of view, from a foreign affairs point of view, all of these policy areas have been an unmitigated disaster. Any time the EU has tried to be involved in Iran, uh, Iran has just been taken a mickey by pushing the deadline and deadline on. Well, we don't have to go into too much detail on Syria to see what uh, EU intervention has, has achieved there. Even in Egypt, I mean, uh, Mr. Gerica was talking earlier on about billions which EU gave uh, uh, Egypt for democracy building, which effectively disappeared down the, down the plug hole. At the moment, there's only one democracy left in the Middle East and only one democracy which the EU feels it can have any leverage over and that's that's uh, that's Israel and as much as anything and I'm gonna again I'm gonna put it bluntly um, there are votes in this issue there's demographics the the, the days of supporting uh, the Jewish community uh, and Israel are uh, I'm not saying they're coming to an end because I think there's a moral imperative to it, but the demographics in Europe are changing so in places like, uh, I, I spoke to a, a Swedish uh, MEP on this issue uh, about Swedish recognition uh, of a Palestinian state. And I said, what, what was the main reason? And he said, the Malmo effect. Malmo, i.e. a big center of, uh, of uh, Muslims in, in, uh, in, uh, in Sweden. And you're finding this in France as well. There's huge populations of Muslims in France and in Germany and all over the place. And politicians are finding, rightly or wrongly, that in order to get their votes, uh, they have to pander a bit to, to certain stereotypes. And I think, you know, that's the real politic of a situation. It's not pretty, it's not nice, but I think there's, there's a truth in that. Yeah. Uh, and, and Thomas, isn't this um, vote here on recognition for a unilateral Palestinian state mm -hmm. here in the European Parliament and other parliaments across Europe uh, another erosion of Israel's authority and moral standing across Europe? It is indeed, and, and I was thinking about it earlier in the discussion, I, because one could ask the question, why do we need a vote also in this parliament? And I think there's a little bit having to do with the uh, self-perception of the European parliament. Uh, excuse me, I'm speaking for the parliament as a whole, but I think there's a sense here that we want to be important. At the same time, we know that the European Parliament do not have authority in, in foreign, foreign policy. So a vote is, of course, a symbolic vote, but wh whereas there are national parliaments which are taking this stand, I think the European Parliament is, is uh, sitting on the side and saying, well, we also want to be important. We can't miss out on this historic uh, tide which, which we are seeing coming our end. So, so this is, uh, I think, a purely, purely, you know, uh, self-centered sort of argument. Uh, what I would like to say, and we have, a, as an organization, you know, sent out uh, alerts to encourage our uh, members to uh, take, make contact with the members here in the European Parliament, just to make their voices heard. And I think this is such an important message that every voice counts. And, and we should never uh, give up, we should, we should express our views, and I think there are very good arguments to, to question this, this vote and question a unilateral uh, recognition of Palestinian state. Um, just to keep it very simply, what we have right now, when we heard it in the program, does not constitute a state. So it goes against everything that international law is, uh, is defining as a state. Um, and just to put it very, uh, you know, shortly and, and bluntly, we, when we have a terrorist organization uh, co-governing 
in, in a Palestinian state. This goes against every principle and value that we hold dear as Europeans. We just cannot compromise with these, with, with these values. Also to say, lastly, that uh, criteria for UN member, uh, member state is that there is a peace-loving, uh, uh, you know, new, new state that is uh, applying for membership. And, and I think we have to use our fantasy to, to, to the extreme to say that Hamas is a peace-loving, uh, you know, government. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and Dermot, maybe you can provide a, a little bit of context to this. Um, you know, in your expertise and knowledge, what do you think are the factors that are uh, undermining the peace process right now between the Israelis and the Palestinians? And how does the dynamics of the European Parliament voting for a unilateral Palestinian state have an impact on the peace process? Um, well, I suppose a couple of things. First of all, as a point of information, the, the, the British vote wasn't for a unilateral Palestinian state. It, it recognised both. So, so I don't think we need to... Um, uh, say if everything's going uh, one way. It, it, in terms of, of the dynamics, the, the other bit of context I would put in is there's some good news, not a lot of good news around the table, <laughs> but there is some, uh, some good news. There's going to be an Israeli general election uh, next year. It's not good news for the Israelis because they have to vote again. But what we will see in the start of 2015 for the first few months is a very intense, uh, deep, uh, loud, um, uh, energetic debate within Israel about where Israel is going and the future of Israel. And then, as they ought to, they will go to the polls and they will choose uh, the government that will, that will take them forward. And I think in that, we will see a, a, the issue around how to develop peace, the issue of Israel's relations with the world, will be a big part of that. And I think it's, um, and we'll see in a part of the world where you don't see that very often. And I think inherently that process will happen. The government of Israel will, will change in some form, um, even though the Prime Minister says there will be some change, and that will happen peacefully and democratically as it ought. Um, and I think that holds out some hope that maybe the, 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 uh, the Israel will be doing its bit to look at itself as well. In terms of, in terms of the EU's role, um, I think, and I, I know it's not um, uh, a quick win, it might not get you the, the, the headlines, but if the European Union is committed, as, as the United States, the United Kingdom, and uh, most other governments are, to a two-state solution, then that's what they should support. And, uh, and that's what they should reiterate their policy to. There, there is no um, quick fix. There's nothing the, the, the Parliament can magic into, into thin air to make two sides uh, sit down and reach, reach peace. So um, what I'd like to see the European Union doing is, is being very clear about the support it gives to the Palestinian Authority to ensure that that's encouraging peace and coexistence Absolutely. and not encouraging uh, terrorism and violence. Um, I think it needs to speak very clearly to the Israelis as well about uh, what Europe expects of them, but have and and th and that's the benchmark. And, and if anything they're doing isn't going to encourage coexistence, isn't going to encourage compromise, but it's going to encourage incitement and terrorism and violence, then they should desist from doing it. And, and I think that's a relatively simple way forward, but would actually have some uh, pragmatic effect. Uh, and Alex, maybe you can share something um, from the Jewish community. How is the Jewish community here in Belgium and in Europe feeling with all these uh, votes across European parliaments on recognition of a Palestinian state? I, I would say disappointed. Um, disappointed and also under threat. I mean, I, I can share with you this is the first Yom Kippur, which was, uh, which was uh, back in uh, sort of late September, uh, early October. It was the first Jewish high holiday where I was too scared to go to synagogue. And there is this feeling amongst the community, a huge debate of a community effectively under siege in Belgium and, and maybe perhaps not in, in, in the UK, but certainly in France and on, on continental Europe, there is a definite feeling of, of, uh, of disappointment but also that nobody is really taking the plight of, of, Jews, uh, of Jews seriously. Yeah. Uh, and finally on this issue, uh, Thomas, um, uh, learning from your experience and expertise, what advice would you give pro-Israel organisations across Europe mm -hmm. in handling the issue of uh, recognition of a Palestinian state? I think this is the time to make our voices heard. I think the, the arguments are on our side, clearly. 
and, and it shouldn't be difficult for us to spell them out, but uh, we just cannot remain passive, we need to be active. Uh, I've said this before, I don't think necessarily that the other side is, uh, that there are more on the other side, but I think that they are better organized many times. And, and we need to get our act together, we need to uh, mobilize our constituency, and, and as you said, Alex, this should not be only a Jewish survival game. We should bring all the peace-loving peoples of, of Europe together. And uh, of course, I'm speaking on, on our Christian community. I think we have a, a special responsibility to stand up for the Jewish people at this time. And, and let me just add that I think what the Jewish community have done when it comes to the persecuted Christians in the Middle East is, is very moving. Uh, the only UN ambassador to speak up in the Security Council for the persecuted Christians in the Middle East is the Israeli ambassador Ron Prosor. And, and I think this is very something to be applauded, but of course it comes back to us, what are we doing for the Jewish community in Europe? Yeah. Uh, and the final issue we're going to be discussing today, and I'll discuss this with you, and this is your campaign, uh, which is Gaza, terror tunnels paid for by the EU. A little flyer there. Um, Alex, uh, can you share with us your campaign? I know that you had an event last month on this issue, the, the, the issue of funding of uh, the reconstruction of Gaza with uh, EU aid money, which is our European taxpayers', taxpayers money. money sure. uh, and uh, can you tell us about this campaign and why you decided to run this particular campaign at this Sure, time. well, we knew uh, the summer was obviously extremely difficult what with Operation Protective Edge, and we saw a level of destruction uh, in Gaza which was, you know, which, which was horrible to see, even though uh, it's been widely accepted that Israel acted with a tremendous amount of restraint. Um, having said that, Gaza does, of course, need to be rebuilt. But I was in Washington, we were, we were meeting uh, various Congress people and uh, people up on the hill. And it struck me, I asked a question, just, uh, just like this, um, just uh, amongst friends. Um, so what controls do you guys have in place on, uh, on US aid? And, it, oh, it's incredible. Uh, full congressional oversight, uh, the accounts which money goes into are controlled uh, fully by, uh, by the Americans. They can't construct, they can't, they can't uh, make a hospital, for instance, without having the contractors in place. And that each, every piece is properly accounted for. And I came back and I started asking the question, well, what does the EU have in place, knowing that Gaza reconstruction was happening? And uh, little by little, we uncovered uh, from court of auditors, from, uh, from the way the money is handled, that the EU effectively has no safeguards in place in how, in how uh, taxpayers' money is looked after. As far as the European Com Commission is concerned, here's the money, uh, here's a rough outline of what you should do with it, but what you do with it after that is, 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 is I know it's shocking, is, is, is up to you. No, it's shocking. Now, we, we were looking at... Um, uh, large amounts of money, as Mr. Gerica pointed out. There was a big conference in Cairo where the EU pledged 450 million euros to, uh, to Gaza. And we're asking the question, why don't MEPs have oversight over how the money is spent? Not only to, to Gaza, but to whether it's Congo, whether it's other, other parts of the world. Uh, why don't they have a say in how this money is spent and how it's controlled? and effectively adopt an American model. 450 million, just to, to give you an idea, the European Court of Auditors found that 2.7% of EU aid as a whole has effectively disappeared. Nobody knows what's happened to it. You apply that 2.7% to the 450 million, that gives you 12 million. 12 million can build some nice tunnels and a lot of Katusha rockets to fire at Israel. Now, and, and I'll, I'll uh, just, just a final point on this, when we were going to committees after the summer, we were hearing from people on the Development Committee. We were hearing people from the Foreign Affairs Committee. We were hearing people from the Human Rights Committee saying, OK, we're going to give this money uh, to, uh, to Gaza, but what's to say in six months' time Israel won't come up and destroy it again? Well, my simple answer is quite, you know, if, if you want to ensure that we avoid another situation, don't arm the very people who are, uh, who are firing the rockets and building the terror tunnels to come into Israel. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and Arnie, I want to bring you on board on this one. I mean, does this issue concern you? 
the fact that uh, EU money can go to help rebuild the construction of Gaza and we don't know what that money is going to be used for, whether it's going to be used for rebuilding some of the homes and, and, and clearly our hearts go out to the Palestinians because of incredible devastation caused by Hamas and let's emphasise that it's Hamas that's in occupation of Gaza uh, and the people there. But can you explain from um, your position uh, how there should be more EU regulation that is more accountable to where the fund's going to ensure that they're not used for terrorism? <clears throat> Just making a step back yet, I'm from the family party and I've made the experience that within the last few months um, the word family has never been so often in Parliament as it has been now in the last few months. And I think that's something we have to try uh, and also focus on, that Israel, as, as a word, comes more often into Parliament. And if we speak of Palestine, we have to make clear what we are speaking of. Absolutely. Yeah? I don't like it to speak of Palestine, not even knowing, am I speaking about the Gaza Strip now, or the West Bank, or parts of uh, Jordan? You know. We have to very clear, make our wording very clear um, what we're talking about. And this is something we should then transport into the media, transport in the, into the, uh, the plenum, make other members hear. Yeah? And that's the one side. The other side, of course, is if we have the wording clear and we know what we're talking about, then we should make it more public that the Americans are taking more care about their tax, pay, tax money than we are at the moment. And this is what our whole uh, um, people living in Europe are arguing about. Where is our money going? So this should also be a very great issue for Israel and uh, Gaza or West Bank. If the money is spent now in Gaza, then we are also, um, it's very important that we know where the money is going. This should be an issue which of course not only concentrates now on, on the, the um, Middle East, but also is important for all the money which is spent. But of course, if some high, um, high amounts go into uh, the Gaza Strip and we know that with Hamas we have a terrorist group on the other side we're negotiating with, then we have to take double, three times, ten times as much care of where the money is going. Yeah. Uh, and Thomas, I, I want to bring you more. I mean, what practical measures can be put in place to ensure that EU money for the reconstruction of Gaza is, is at going to exactly what it should be going to, and that is the rebuilding of homes and not being used for terrorism, not a refunding of terror tunnels, uh, missiles and rockets, uh, and also uh, Hamas's terrorist infrastructure? Well, this may be more uh, Alex's uh, table, but let me just give a, a, a few remarks. Uh, obviously, we have need to apply the strictest uh, accounting measures uh, with all of our tax money, but I think in specifically with uh, funds which can be used in such a deadly way and which we have seen the uh, examples of uh, recently. Uh, we, as I've said on this program before, we raised this issue the first time in 2005 uh, when, uh, when Hamas was still the uh, opposition, small militia group. And um, it's interesting at that time, it, it was not a popular, it's never a popular issue to raise in this parliament to say, where is the money going? Uh, so everyone were more or less against us. But what happened then, you, you've, um, all of a sudden Hamas is in power. And, and overnight everything changes. Everyone knows that this was because of the corruption in Fatah. So overnight, the narrative changes like 180, 80 percent. And, um, you know, sometimes you just have to say, keep saying the obvious things. There will come a time uh, when, when people will have a fresh look at it again and say, well, of course, this is madness. Why didn't anyone tell us this before? Uh, but, but perhaps just to say that it has happened at that time, uh, funding to uh, Fatah were, were uh, put on hold. For, for a period. It happened, if I'm not mistaken, in, in December 2004. And this was as a result of organizations such as ours and others who were, uh, keep, were keep raising these questions in all the committees. So this is not in vain. Uh, when it comes to all the, what are the accounting measures that needs to be put in place, I'm, I'm sure Alex and, and um, the, you know, our colleagues in Washington can, can help us with that. And we should, we should ask for their help. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, and Dermot, I mean, the, the British public already becoming disillusioned with the EU. Uh, and, and clearly, the EU has to do much more to actually win back the trust of not only the, probably the British people, but other European population of uh, EU member states. Um, but I, I think more people across Europe will be happier if, for example, our taxes are not being used indirectly to, uh, to fund terrorism. Uh, what can be done? Well, no, I, I entirely agree. I mean, interestingly, the UK Parliament also recently voted to ring fence uh, the UK's international aid at 0.7%, the UN target, and um, which is increasing in a time, as we all know, of austerity and less money. So I think for the British public, they, they, they do value the work that good international aid can do, and they see it as a moral imperative um, that, that those in the richer countries should, should contribute. Um, however, the same issues arise is, is that that money needs to be well spent and putting in money w without knowing where it goes in, in many parts of the world. These are often very unstable parts of the world with kleptocrats and criminals of various kinds. Um, you know, you're actually doing more harm than good. And so adding that level of accountability uh, is vital. So, so I certainly think on, on, on this issue, um, clearly both prescribing an organisation as terrorist and allowing it to be funded is is um, undermining your own sort of policies. And I, I, I think it's uh, the British public will demand as well that, that, that this uh, this issue is sorted out. What needs to be done is is I don't know the technical details. Of what I do, I don't know if Alec has a better idea. <clears throat> but first of all, you have to recognise the problem. Secondly, you have to commit yourself to, to fixing it. And thirdly, put in place the mechanisms uh, like the Americans have in order to ensure that doesn't happen. But at the moment, I think, I think we're still stuck at first base, which is, look, there is a problem here, guys. <laughs> it comes back again to, to the choices the Palestinians have to make, responsibility for their actions. If they rebuild tunnels, if they rearm themselves, if they target civilians in southern Israel again, the pattern will repeat itself. I don't want that to happen, but we've got to know who's responsible, and also the, the EU has to be responsibility, responsible for its own actions. And if it's willfully blind to what's going on, it will perpetuate the cycle of violence. Absolutely. Uh, we're down to the last three minutes, so um, I'll, I'll give you, Alex, uh, the, the final word on this issue. Um, how can our viewers who feel very, very concerned that there could be um, a misuse of EU funds for the reconstruction of Gaza um, get involved with uh, your campaign? OK, uh, the first thing to do would be to uh, get in touch with your MEP. Uh, and it, that's a relatively simple thing to do. Outline your concerns and the MEP will then, uh, will then respond to you. But also, um, I tend to find that the politicians, uh, <laughs> excuse me for saying <laughs> this, very few are, are proactive on their own, but, but they do respond to public opinion fairly quickly. So uh, whether it's this or any other issue, um, write to your MEP, um, uh, express your concerns, say that you believe there should be uh, better control of what is effectively your money as a taxpayer, and uh, ask them to take it forward and look at it. And uh, the MEP will know very quickly to, to get in touch with European Friends of Israel. This campaign is ongoing, and uh, we, we want to get to a situation where there are proper controls and checks and balances on all EU aid, not just to Gaza, but to, on all EU aid. Um, and so, as you say, if, uh, to stop this cycle of violence. Uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, and also, where can they get information as well? Where can uh, you can get, get, it, information? Then get it from our website, uh, European Friends of Israel. You can find it on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, or just pick up the phone and give us a call. It's, uh, sorry, that sounds a bit <laughs> like Tele Shopping Channel, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, by all means, get in touch with us and we'll, we'll give them any information they need. But on our website uh, and on Facebook, you'll find all the information you need uh, on, on our campaign. Excellent. Uh, gentlemen, I just want to thank you so much uh, for joining me on the uh, last edition of uh, the European Report for 2014. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, I want to thank you for watching uh, this programme today. For our Jewish viewers, we want to say Nahak Samer for Hanukkah. And on behalf of the European Report, we also want to wish our Christian viewers a very happy Christmas and New Year. But we also need to reflect on some of the major issues that are facing Europe and Israel today. Uh, and never before have we needed to raise our voices. Never before have we had to speak up for Israel and the Jewish people who feel very much under siege with everything that's going on in Europe today. So thank you for watching today's European Report.